Spotlight on Sydney, it's for you and me. Spotlight on Sydney, thanks for having me. <laughs>
you know they they want they want what you've got yeah and, and there's not as much quiet around no. and I think quiet is actually one of the things you need to be really creative yeah. and you need to almost get bored and get to the point where your brain starts doing stuff yeah yeah, yeah. that's true and um so when you got when did you start singing in bands when did that start happening gosh I did um I used to do amateur musicals. I ah, thought I wanted to yeah. be in musicals. And I'm glad that it didn't go that way, but it only didn't go that way because I'm not a good enough dancer. So I would I would be in amateur musicals and I was okay, I was good enough for those, but as soon as I started auditioning for professional musicals, you know, the first round is usually a, a singing audition and I would do fine in that. And then the second round would be the chorus line thing. And you know, everyone's going, Pooey, left leg, right leg, and I'd still be facing the wrong way. I'm yeah. just, I'm not, I'm not, you know, hugely clumsy or anything, but I just, I don't, don't have that skill. I'm just not a that level of a dancer, and no matter how many lessons I took, I just could never get there. So I kind of gave up on the musical theatre thing. But it was while I was doing an amateur musical show. Can I, can I name drop you? We were talking about name drop, dropping drop, before. Drop this away. is the best because guess who was in the show with me? Oh, I know this story. Hugh Jackman, right? Oh, I'm, no, no, no. That's no, a different name no, drop. No, I mean, no. I have told this story many times before. But, you know, I mean, if if you were pals with Hugh Jackman, wouldn't you want to say? So we were, we were in a musical together. Anyway, it was during this musical, and <laughs> this is the best bit about Hugh. He was one of our backing dancers. Oh. I've got a video, and if I didn't look so shocking in it, I might show more people. But I also, you know, out of respect for Hugh as well. But he was um, our backing uh, dancer and there were two other singers and we had a three girl rap group which is crazy if you've ever heard me rap I mean I'm the daggiest female white person who should not be rapping but that's what that's what we did we had this little rap trio and sometimes we would have a live band other times it would be kind of a backing track thing but that was my first band experience so with these girls that I met during the musical theatre days just- and Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking more about your ScoMo story. Oh, my ScoMo story, yes. That, that was earlier. That I was a, I was like about six or seven when I was in a musical with our current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. <laughs> and it was actually a pantomime um, that was written about Scotty. And I still have to stop myself calling him Scotty because that's just what his name was and Mandy. So it was a, a pantomime that was actually written about us and he was my big brother. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So all and, the support for the arts that he does now, you can see where that's come from. Yeah, I can see that well. So you toured a lot. I mean, when I first saw you, you were playing with Richard Cl- You were singing with Richard oh, okay, Clayton yeah. and Wendy Matthews. Mm-hmm. So, and, yeah, the touring, um, I guess, only really stopped when I, be- I got pregnant mm. and it got harder to do. And, yeah. you know, I, I knew that I didn't want to be away for long periods of time. But I did tour a um, little bit of overseas stuff, but certainly a lot of, around Australia with Wendy Matthews and Richard Clapton mainly. I also toured with my own stuff. Um, yeah. I went over to Popcom in Germany, the big music convention, and while I, I did that two different years, uh, one year it was in Berlin, one year it was in Cologne in Germany, and um, at the same time, because I was going over there, and as Australians know, you leave the country, you might as well really go for it because yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. expensive to go anywhere from here. So I ended up doing uh, a tour all around the UK and um, Germany, Switzerland, a few other kind of little places in Europe, Spain, at the same time with my original stuff, which was lots of fun. So I do, I love touring. I could easily be one of those people that just tours all the time, except it does not fit in with family. Mm, oh, oh, it could, it could. Yeah, you you could mean, be the Partridge family. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, I mean, some of those, like Marsha Hines used to drag her daughter along and put her in a little basket yeah, beside the right. state. Like, I just don't know if we could do, you'd be allowed to do that anymore. Probably not, no. no. <laughs> and it's not necessarily fair on the husband as well and you know there's a lot of people to consider and you know elderly yeah, parents yeah. and it's yeah but I, I do love touring I really do the Sydney scene then I know you were working a lot what what did you think of it then you mean before I mean, COVID hit and it went no, kind no, of crazy back oh when it back the good then. old days oh yeah. gosh I, I was having an absolute ball I don't think I ever thought about the health of the scene because you're just working and you don't think about it until it's not as healthy anymore. I felt like 
there was always one project that kind of seemed to lead into something else. And I've always loved uh, the variety. I mean, people always say, oh, you work a lot. And I think the reason I do is because I've got one of those type A personalities that kind of just wants to work all the time. You know, I'm on holidays for half an hour. I'm like, do, 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 what can I do? <laughs> it's work related. And I love what I do, like you. Mm-hmm. So I want to work all the time. But I actually really like the variety. I like, um, you know, touring with somebody else and then doing my own thing. I love being a backing vocalist, but I don't only want to be that because I want to be out front doing the thing as well. But I love being part of a band. I like all the different um, roles in different shows that I do. Yes. So, you know, it's it, that's what keeps it interesting for me. It's the combination of all of those things. I wouldn't, it's funny people say, oh, you do covers. Why would you do covers? I would get bored silly doing my own music only. Yeah. I would always want to do covers as long as if I think I'm the best writer in the world. So many people have written so many great songs. I want to sing them too. Yeah, yeah. It's all, and it's all part of learning too. Oh, doing other definitely. Stuff. Absolutely. Because you're not writing. I mean, when you write, you write for your voice. But when you're singing someone else's material, you know, there's, it's always a lot bigger challenge. Yeah. Back in the 80s and 90s, there was just, there was so many pockets of music too that you could sort of move around and... Yeah. It worked six nights a week. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I, I was working you six... You must have been working more. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Is it possible to work more than six yeah, nights? Maybe well, partly. Yeah, two gigs Yeah, sometimes there yeah. were two gigs on, yeah. you know, weekend days. Although I do feel like I missed out on the really high times. I mean, I hear... Um, the 80s. The 80s was really where it was at. And, you know, unfortunately I wasn't working then. But when, when I... For music, yes. What's that? The 80s were very good for original music. yeah. Much better because you had all these major bands like In Excess and you were the support band. And it was all about that, wasn't yeah. it? The pub yeah. scene up and down the coast was really healthy Huge. and the bigger venues. And, yeah, so I never really got to experience that. But I also do think there's no point in sitting around whinging about how bad the scene is because yeah. I think we're in the type of job that we can create our own work to a certain extent. It's not easy, but you can. Yeah, yeah, you have to. I think it's different, like for an actor or a dancer who are relying on productions and other people to do things most of the time. I think in the performing arts, we're in a slightly better position. We could put a one person show together or put a bigger show together and get other people and then sell it yourself. It is possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and that's what you do, which leads me to my next question (laughs) is that. You put the Pop Tarts together. Yeah, that's where we met. The 2000s, yeah, yeah. Tell us about Pop Tarts because I couldn't explain it. Well, Pop Tarts was a female fronted uh, band or a female singer songwriter night. So the reason I started it is when I was doing my own original music and the stuff that I was doing, still am to a certain extent, but even more so, was very poppy. And I wanted to play. In pubs, just I wanted to play. It didn't have to be in pubs, but they're the places where you tend to be able to get gigs that aren't the really big ones. Yeah. You know, I would have loved to work at the entertainment centre, but no one was offering. So, you know, I wanted to I wanted to work regularly, basically doing my original stuff with a band. And so I approached a few pubs, and it was all really rock oriented. There wasn't a lot of gigs where you could do singer songwritery stuff, which is not necessarily me, but all pop. Hmm. And I found that all my female singer songwriter and performing friends were having exactly the same issue so i i spoke to an agent that i did cover bands through and he said let's approach a pub together i know one who are really open to this kind of thing put on a night put it on on a week night and do it regularly i think it started off as a monday and then ended up being a tuesday and it varied over the 10 years of its life and you know you build it up over time and then it can become a place where you could play as often as you want. You could mm. do every week if you wanted, and I did yeah. at first. Mm. And then after that, you know, I probably did it at least once a month. And then you can get other people to come on board too. You can promote stuff together, and it's good for the scene. It's good for everybody. So it was really the agent that I had to thank for that. And, you know, the branding, I wanted it to be kind of cute branding that people would remember. And I thought, okay, well, pop is the thing, and pop is a very broad umbrella. Yeah. And um, Pop-Tarts is that American breakfast cereal. Let's call it Pop-Tarts. It's a name people remember. I got a little logo designed and it kind of tried to make it a thing. And, you know, we would get stuff in the papers. And the thing is, on a Monday or Tuesday night, there's not a lot happening. So uh, the media are quite willing to... They they need material for those kind of off nights. So we got a lot of profile from it. It was good for the pub. 
We did it at the Empire in Annandale for, I don't know, That's seven right. years. Yeah. Then we um, they renovated, and so we moved to the Unity Hall Hotel in Balmain. We ended up doing a TV show that we filmed and we'd um you know do backstage talks with with the artists and that's good for the artists they suddenly get footage which is partly what you're doing here and um that was on community tv and that ended up going national a lot of the community tv stations picked up pop tarts the tv show and then we would do a birthday show where we do a bigger venue like the basement yeah, yeah. and um, then everyone you know would get a chance to work at a bigger better venue that maybe under their own steam would be too hard yeah. but when you've got a theme and people knew pop tarts then yeah. you know if there were six different acts and maybe they hadn't heard of any of them or only one of them then you had that collective power and then you had the name as well yeah. and the only reason i stopped doing pop tarts is i got pregnant and had a child and it was just <laughs> you know there was a lot of work to run something yeah. like that which i loved but i had to really think about where i was putting my time and i, I couldn't afford to you know keep doing that to the level it was i wonder what would have where it would have gone with who the knows oh my God, i know again that's right, because we didn't even, we had MySpace at the end of it. We That's didn't even right. have Facebook in those days. But it was a huge, it was a huge, it was so successful. You must have had so I many loved people it. saying, can I go on it? Yeah. And I we, know, I did. We, oh, well, <laughs> well, that's like, how yeah. I met you. It was fantastic. And we also, um, uh, my publisher, because I've got some of my songs um, with a publisher in Melbourne, and he's actually a TV guy. And so he started with, you know, he asked me if he could do Pop Tarts Melbourne. So he was running showcases down there oh, and filming wow. those as well. Yeah. So, I mean, wouldn't really call it a franchise. There was no money involved or anything, but it's kind of built out and became a bigger thing. And I still, even though it's been a few years, since, well, it's been 10 years, gosh, since it, 11 years almost since I've done that, since we finished it. But I meet female singer-songwriters and I think, how come I don't know you? Because at one stage I knew every female singer-songwriter, not only in Sydney because people would come from other states and that's what you want yeah. when you go interstate. You want something that's established that you can turn up and perform at. So you want to come backstage? Come with me. It felt really special too. Because and was... you know the best thing about it? Everyone was friendly. It yeah, was yeah. the only time I ever had an artist say something nasty about another artist. I hate to say this. It was a male. It's, and I'm not saying because What's he's he male doing in there? that happened. Oh, no, well, because it's female-fronted band. So sometimes yeah, yeah, the players yeah. in a band would be male. Just mm -hmm. the, the main artist has to be female. But uh, he actually said to me, oh, this must get really bitchy, you know, all these girls working together. And I'm like, nah, mm -hmm. this is all about supporting other girls. And the thing is, I ended up building up a mailing list of all the artists too. And I would get things like, this happened multiple times. Clear magazine one day rang and said, I, I, ne I need um, a female singer. I want to interview them about this particular thing. And I heard that you know a lot of female singers. So I became kind of the... Uh, madam. <laughs> yeah, almost, almost. Musical, musical madam. Yeah, exactly. So I'd get mm. people sending me opportunities that they wanted a female for. And they knew if they got to me, then they'd get to a couple of hundred people. So it's easier for them to come to one person than to go separately. Mm. And I love the fact that I could pass stuff on. And then a lot of other people the artists in that group would then think, well, actually, I can't do this gig. Maybe one of those girls would want to do it. Hmm. And it's lovely. It's it's two ways. You get a lot out of it as well because the opportunities bounce back. Yeah. So yeah. And that was they, a lovely they thing. They should. Yeah. They should and they do. Yeah. And yeah. even there were um, people that would tour from overseas and they heard, oh, there's a showcase that we can do. We want to perform when we're in Sydney. And then I went to London as part of one of my tours and I managed to get a gig over there, which is quite hard in London because a lot of it's very pay for play. But I got it through a contact that had done Pop Tarts here. So wow. that kind of stuff was really, oh, you're making me miss it. Oh, I was, <laughs> I have to it do was it so again. <laughs> and I mean, you've got a lot of strings to your bow too. I mean, you, where do I start? Singer, director, 
a producer, bloggist um, <laughs> interview. You do a lot of interviews with a lot of yeah. musicians and singers and songwriters, and you do well, you songwriter. Uh, what else? Acting, you know. Not dancer. Not dancer. Not dancer. <laughs> yeah. But yes, I mean, um, how do you find it now with the internet and social media doing Fantastic. All yeah, it's great. It's just, it? oh, it's fantastic. I know people, you know, can get upset by Facebook and those kind of things. Yeah. But my whole thing is all Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're talking about, all it is is the world online and yes people can hide to a certain extent so i do mm. understand that that may be a comment that someone makes on facebook or something they you know they might not make in real life but i just think you have to expect there's going to be good and there's bad yeah. but the thing is i mean i you know that I, I think if the people who buy my cds all around the world how is that going to happen and sure when i toured i could sell CDs to people in the cities I tour at, but that's a very limited amount of exposure you're getting to people overseas. And now I feel like I have a much more international career. And, you know, I'm learning about artists from overseas, indie artists that I would never learn about. It's just fantastic. Yeah. The access is like post, bing, and it goes out to the world. I think, I think during this COVID time when I've been working a lot less, as in gigging a lot less because there's been less gigs I feel like I've been working just as hard but I've been able to put my head into so many different other creative projects that aren't necessarily about making money but just for the sake of them yeah and yeah. just sharing them and then you know you get comments from people saying I've had a really bad day it's been horrible you know a lot of I have connections with a lot of people in the states and obviously their COVID situation is particularly dire mm. and you know you'll get one message from someone saying oh just you know your music just made made my day so much better and there you go that's yeah. why I do this makes me feel that good as well it's selfish too but you think you know something you're doing that you have a great amount of fun doing anyway and then you share it and you make someone's day yeah that's awesome but you're particularly good at doing it so I worked at Microsoft. I actually worked for a PR company that had lots of different IT clients, but Microsoft was one of them. And I ended up um, getting an office in Microsoft and working directly with them over there. And I don't think I had any you know, natural love of, of technology necessarily before then. I probably dipped my toes in the water at uni because we certainly worked with cameras and we ran the radio station and that kind of thing. Okay. But I could have taken a leave-in, leave <laughs> left <laughs> technology at that stage. But I, I think Microsoft probably really gave me the love of it. And I just realised you just touch all the buttons and eventually something works. I think people fear technology. And so yeah. I ended up being the one in the marketing department that people would come to if their computers wouldn't work. And I just press all the buttons until something did. What's the worst you can do, you know? That was always my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I just think it's it's that. And, it, you know, I decided I want something edited and I would, <clears throat> you know, when I was doing my music, I would hire an editor and then I'd end up sitting over shoulder going, no, can't the, oh, I reckon it look good there if you go there. And thought, just do it yourself. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. So I just, if I want to get something done, I just, I usually know what I want in my head. So it's just easier for me to learn it, to how to do it myself. That's right. But in those days, you wouldn't have sort of needed that or thought about because no. you didn't have social media. And now That's that it. it's here, it. your brain's just gone immediately into, oh, yeah, which is, you know? it, yeah. I really feel like I've come into myself because yeah. it's like all these doors have opened and it's like, yes, they're the ones I wanted to be there. I yeah. might not have known it, but they're the ones I wanted. And you have all that knowledge locked away. Yeah. You know, that's just, you just needed something to, to give it, it off. You do do a lot of tribute shows, um, like the Fleetwood Mac show, yeah. and, but really good ones and done not as your Stevie Nicks and your, no. but they're done brilliantly and uniquely and originally yeah. as you can get. And you do wood, a Woodstock show and things like that. Apart from your original music, mm -hmm. do you get, so you're finding now with COVID, I think we talked about this, that you've got finally more time not doing those shows. Yeah. Because although they're fun and they pay the bills, yeah, they take so much. It's like a day job. For I sure. Guess, only more fun. And you don't realise either. No. Because the thing is, I mean, at one stage I counted, I was in 12 different shows. <laughs> the cover, you know, type, mostly tributes. Yeah. And I loved all of them. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing them. Yeah. But 
my brain's not big enough to hold 12 entire shows without needing to rehearse them a little bit beforehand again. Yeah. So you might find that one of the shows lies dormant for a few months and you've got to do all that work in, in kind of polishing it up again and re remembering all what you're doing and there's yeah. costumes and there's all sorts of things. Oh, and bands, so yeah, hiring bands. Oh, so much of that gigs. stuff. And the preparation, I remember one of the mums at my um, school on finding out as a singer said oh that'd be fantastic you just have all your days off and I'm like no <laughs> and then obviously we're small businesses so there's so much work as far as the marketing the admin and, and whatever else but yeah, you take it you take the gigs away and suddenly there's a mass of time that you didn't even really realize you were spending because yeah. it's not only you get in the car and from that point on you're at a gig but even that I mean with those big shows the sound checks at five, and then you yeah. don't get home till one a.m. So it's pretty much a full day, and that's not considering any of the work leading up to actually getting in the car. And your child. And a child. Like actually getting yes. off to a gig, waiting for the <laughs> yes. babysitter, etc. Oh, et yes. Although you do have a husband, Simon. I do have a husband, Simon, who is also a musician. <laughs> yes, but luckily we don't work well. It's kind of I miss. I was so lovely today that we got to work together because we don't do it very often. Yeah. Because one, we have our, our own things happening, but it's hard for us to work together because then we need a babysitter. Yes. So we tend to balance each other out. And when one person's gigging, the other person tries not to. And I, I do most of the gigging and he does most of the teaching. And yet, but you, you collaborate together a little bit too, do you? Or do you write, he's well, not involved in your original the last The last three releases I've had has, has just been me as far as writing. Before that, he did. And he hasn't even played on anything for a couple of releases. Oh, really? But I, after hearing his guitar Tonight, today, ah. and also the rehearsals leading up to this, I'm like, oh, I miss that. He yeah. gets me gotcha. and my sound. So I'm going to drag him back in whether he likes it or not. Good stuff. Mm. Yeah, because um, it must be, I can't imagine. I mean, I write all my stuff on my own, but I always bring all my boys in yeah my favorite people no, so you it's do a quite lot of different. it your own. I don't produce my own music I mean I, oh don't you no you th there was one song on my last release that was very stripped back it was basically piano and cello and bass and double bass and mm. I produced that that's because I can do something like that but I'm, I'm not a whiz bang music producer Oh, I I, I use that. with Spang music producers because I like there's a certain amount of skill I have, but there are people that are so much better at it that I would mm. much rather. Well, it's get having them. an outside and that the outside where you get too close to yes, stuff. Yes, absolutely. You, start, you know. Yeah. So I record all my own vocals at home, and I, I produce fairly comprehensive demos. So sometimes mm. I listen back to the demo, and go, oh, actually, it hasn't changed that much. <laughs> But what they do, they just can put the, the sheen on. And as you say, having that third party going, you know, you might think that sounds good. No, it doesn't. This will sound better. Yeah. Although so, I'm, you know, my producers always say, it's good to work with someone who knows what they want. And sometimes yeah. I wonder if they're going, she's really bossy. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you've got a very unique style of music, I think. I think it's very unique. And, it, it, you know, the pop cabaret Thing, but there's a there's a nice darkness to it, a blueness to it that I like. Yeah, I think I like I, all my songs sound a little bit sad. I think, yeah, but I yeah. like I like a dark street, poignant, and, yeah, and chilling. I would <laughs> yes. say sometimes. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> but I, I think when you write a song, do you actually think ahead of the video? You immediately yes. start going, "Yeah, I thought you might." <laughs> I do, and you know what I've even done. I've even written a song so that I could use a certain costume, a certain video. That's like good. I almost have the the look of the video before, not most of the time, but sometimes I've, I actually, I don't know if you saw one of my recent videos called Man Who Fell to Earth. Oh, yes, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. well, Good I mean, there's, there's lots of re reasons why that video turned out the way it did, but part of it, I bought the alien outfit. I just saw it on an online store and not that it's meant to be an alien outfit. I made it in, you know, that's what I interpreted it as, but it's a silver bodysuit. So what else is it going to be? I saw this and went, I want that. Like, I'm not going to be able to wear it down the shops. So I need to create a music video where I can wear that. And it wasn't, it was two years later that the music video happened, but I've got a whole lot of stuff in my small house in big crates that if I see just some outrageous clothes or I've got a costume designer that I actually do use who has um, sales every now and again where she just clears the racks 
and she makes some crazy stuff and she always saves the crazy stuff for me because she knows that there's a good chance actually this dress came this from her this beautiful dress eh? yeah um, that, that, that I, I will want it and sometimes I've bought stuff that I have no idea what I'm going to do with it but I just love the look of the thing yeah. and then I end up thinking okay well I, I could do a video with that but I don't know the song so I write the song to match it back to front so what did you write about that spacesuit? So the song that um, brought that spacesuit into being was called Man Who Fell to Earth. Man Who Fell to Earth, David Bowie fans would recognise as a movie that he was in. He had a song too and an album called Man Who Sold the World. So it's not the same. It sounds a bit similar. So there's yeah. no song before mine called "Man Who Fell to Earth." Yeah, just the I movie. Thought they, I thought it was from. Oh, is yeah. That no, a lot of people have said that to me. Oh, it's the same name, and it's like no, it's yeah, it's very it sounds similar. But he had a movie that he was in called "Man Who Fell to Earth," where he played an alien, and. I have been in love with David Bowie mm. forever when I first discovered him because for me he is that theatre and rock combination mm. and I love you know the theatre of pop or, or whatever I you know I I'm not into the shoegazing type thing I like <laughs> the show yeah. that's for me you know I wanted to do musical theatre so you know I'm gonna love that and David Bowie with his Ziggy Stardust and his costumes oh my gosh I loved and then I discovered that he had done all these movies and he that he loved sci-fi like I've read interviews where he's, he loved sci-fi and Ziggy Stardust and Starman and you know all of those um, songs that he's written about space I think that was a massive influence on me and when he died I was so devastated and I know that you know famous people die just like regular people die and in most cases I'm like oh well, that's sad because they're a great talent but it hasn't personally affected me and people that kind of go overboard when someone famous <laughs> dies I'm like come on they weren't your mate but yeah. then David Bowie died yeah. and I really I kind of got it because I grew up with him he sort I felt of like you in a way. Yeah. so many ways mm. and so that song is my tribute to David Bowie Great. Yeah. It's beautiful. I've seen, I've, I've sung it with you. You have too. Oh, hey, yeah, it's great. You are the one. <laughs> yeah, that was good. So, so you did have, I always wondered about whether you had background in theatre or something because yeah. your, your videos and, and it's refreshing because I think there is a lot of sort of samey videos around. I mean, we're, we're all sort of you've just got this mind that goes into this and, it, and a lot of it's joyous even when it's dark well that's no, what I, I hope it is that I'm glad you said that because mm. I mean I know my songs sound sad and I like you I like I like the darkness just because I like that kind of sound but I'm actually a really happy person I know you and are. I, think, I think almost maybe I'm happy because I get the sadness out I'm able to express that part of me through my songs and my videos and so I don't I don't have the burden of the sadness anymore I don't know yeah yeah possibly yeah it, it's but I think it's also a theatrical thing yeah that's when you really feel yeah. I mean I like having a good cry I like yeah. reading a book or watching a movie that makes me cry Something ideally in and up because that's the way it's really going to move me. I mean, yeah. I, I love to laugh and I love to dance and all that kind of emotion as well, but it's the that sad feeling that feels like it gets to you. If I could teach you all the secrets that I've learned about the world, I would. And I would show you only goodness in the world If I could Every song has to have something mm. in it. It almost gives it depth. Yeah. Because, I mean, nothing in life is 100% joy only. It, there's always a bit of yin and yang, Ooh. you know? <laughs> Is that deep chocolate? Or <laughs> Maybe chocolate. Maybe. No, but then no, that no, makes you bad. <laughs> no, but that, that's I, I just like that. I just think you know, and you, and you also have a, a great style. Like every gig I've done with you or seen you at, you've always got 
a great style? Did anyone influence any like move like forties movies or have an influence on how you dress? Your I don't know. I mean, thank you for saying that. But my my mum always had an amazing fashion style. She always mm. made her own clothes. And she's re- that's something I'm not good at at all. I've never been able to make. I, I mean, I guess I haven't really tried, but it doesn't feel like that's one of my natural talents. But um, <laughs> she is re- she was really really good at at fashion. And she was always. I remember I went to. It was actually called Girls Brigade, but basically it's like brownies run by the uh, Prime Minister's mother. I should say God, she was there. I know she was there. <laughs> she was the head of the um, Girls Brigade that I went to. But I remember it was on a Friday night, and she, my mum would come and pick pick me up afterwards. And she was always dressed to the nines. I remember mm. this um, leopard skin um, jumpsuit that she had with the matching turban. And the other mums, I know, right? The, uh, it's like coming up, picking up your kid from school dressed like that, basically. Yeah, yeah, nice. The other mums would be in their trackies because it's Friday, it's the end of the, the working week. And she would come in, you know, head to toe glamour. She just really liked it. Yeah, that's nice. And so I, I think, and she was always... You know, she always hates it. She loves going out to see shows and singers and whatever else. She always hates it when she feels like the entertainer hasn't made much of an effort. An effort, yeah. yeah. And I think it's rubbed off on me. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think sometimes jeans and a singlet is the right thing if that's what you do. Yeah. But that's not what I do. Yeah. I mean, my music tends to go to the melodramatic and the theatrical, so I have to kind of, I feel like I have to live in that space yeah. visually as well. You know? Yeah, because I've seen you in a lot of different It depends shows. what you do. You have You've to. still got your, you still manage to keep your uniqueness no matter what show I've seen you in, but you still fit I the try music. and, yeah, like, I do yeah. Fleetwood Mac and so I'll yeah. have to have some crochet, you know. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah, so. <laughs> but that's part of the fun. I, I mean, they're dressing up and you know wigs and makeup and costumes. It's the, the musical theatre thing again. That's so much what I love about it. There's so many singers, and I think that's part of the reason I work a lot because you know you. I remember in the early days, one of the calls I got. Um, all right, and I'm, I'm putting on this accent because this is the very Aussie guy that hired me. All right, I need a girl singer, and she's got to play the lager phone. It's going to be on a cruise and George Foreman's going to be there. You know George Foreman, the yeah, boxer, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So he was out on a cruise on Sydney Harbour. you got to wear one of those hats with the corks and you got to sing Walsing Matilda and play the lager phone. Now, if you don't know, oh, no, a lager phone <laughs> is basically a broom handle with beer bottle tops. Top, so it goes jingle, yeah. jingle, jingle. I'm like, yeah, awesome. And how many singers do you know that would I go, oh, I don't think so, <laughs> which is fair enough. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds great, especially at the beginning of my career when I was just happy to do, you anything, know, yeah, anything. singing. And so I wore the whole, you know, Walsing Matilda outfit, going, Walsing Matilda, you know, with this lager phone. I got a photo with George Foreman that I'm still very proud of. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so, but, I mean, if there's an opportunity to dress up, then I'm doubly wanting to do the gig. But a lot of, a lot of performers aren't necessarily like that no and I think which is fair enough too we're all just who we are you know some people never find themselves and I think the thing about doing original music is you find your look and your place through doing your own music you do because you've got the freedom haven't you to actually do what you want and and you get to a certain age too where you just go you know what if your thing is yeah whatever I, I look I care less what people think I know my style of music is different than what's you know most popular and most fashionable. I've never really fitted into what is happening at the time. Yeah, yeah. But I kind of tried to and realised that I'm just never going to be cool. So just be yourself because that's actually cooler that's in the cool. end. That's cool. You know, it is cool. Yeah. That's, that's how. I'll never be hip. I'll never be that kind of cool. But I think the more you try to be that when you, it's really not in you, then it's yeah. really uncool. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just kind of gone, you know what, take me or leave me. This is what I do if you like it. That's great. <laughs> that's great. So... Have you got a new album coming up? Yes. Well, COVID has been good to me in that way, that it's given me time to focus a bit more. I was writing an album anyway, but I feel like I've got it done a little bit quicker than I would have. So I do this thing. I did this with um, the last mini album. I put out an, um, a six track, so I call it mini album, last mm. December. And I actually gave the whole thing away as far as the downloads, the digital downloads to anyone who joined my mailing list. Because, you know, I wanted people to be on my mailing list so I had people to share my music with. Mm -hmm. And that worked great. And actually a lot of people bought the CD as well. 
because I, you know, still make hard copy CDs. Yeah. And I'm going to do something similar. I, I loved the comments. I loved the sharing. I loved everything about that process. I know you do, don't you? I do. <laughs> it's just a thrill when people like something you've done and, and it, you know, I love it when a song moves me. So to think that I can create that for someone else is, you know, is amazing. So I, I probably won't give away the entire album because it's going to be much bigger. So I'll probably give away half the album. And um, I'm thinking I've, I've already done at least half the album and, you know, recorded half of it at least. Mm. I think I've done about seven tracks so far that are fully finished and mixed and everything. So I'm thinking any day now I'm going to start sending that out to my mailing list. And what I did, what I did last time and what I'll do again, for each song I created a web page and the web page included the lyrics. It had little hidden things that you could click on and find maybe a different mix or a chart for the song. And I did a background video where I explain how I made it or what, you know, something about it, a behind the scenes type thing. And I did that page for every song. I had so much fun doing that. I had so much fun. Just another element of creation. But it was also really lovely that, you know, people could understand where I was coming from with the song. And so they could relate to it better. And so yeah. oh, I might do that again because, you know, I like keeping busy. Yeah, well, but, but it's all interesting. It's, yeah. To me, it's really well, it's interesting, interesting for me. I know. And you just keep coming up with stuff. It's yeah. just like, where could this girl go if somebody <laughs> gave you lots of money and yeah. said, here's a TV show. Oh, yeah, that'd be Imagine nice. Imagine that. I would love that. That's well, I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing my own little TV shows now because twice yeah, a week yeah. I do a little live stream, and I've just got into OBS, which is you know the software that allows you to not only just have you, but to have multiple cameras and to be able to play videos and show other things. Mm. And so now I'm even doing funny cat videos occasionally because it cheers people up. So yeah. I'll you know I think what am I here for? I'm here to entertain you. And to make you feel good, whether it's through my music. Most of the time I'm just talking, mm -hmm. but I'm getting comments. So I'm having a conversation as much yeah. as I can, which is lovely. And then I'll do a little live song at the end and play an old video or a current video or something else. So it's starting to turn into a, a variety show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, which, um, which I'm really enjoying. Yeah, so it's like the Pop Tarts thing kind of again, but it's just me because the thing is the, the little space that I film in is tiny. I can't really well, fit any guests. Easier. As we were discussing earlier, it's nice to just do it on your own. Yes, anyway, you don't have to absolutely. worry about anybody else. Yes. So hopefully you keep get you know, you get more and more popular and, and more and more people viewing. So, you know, people hopefully will look at Amanda Easton dot com. Yeah. <laughs> That'd and, be good. And have a look at all your different, the uh, different facets of your mm. your uh, whole career is amazing. Thank it blows, you. you know, it blows my mind. Because not just that you're the hardest working woman that I know, <laughs> but uh, and you're always something that has been missing a lot from a lot of singers. Only a few singers that I know that that are so bloody together and <laughs> have, you know learn their stuff and I think that must know. be the business background you know having to the, do the corporate thing and just having to show up and having to do all that stuff that I just thought that was normal and I was quite surprised how many people weren't weren't like yeah, that I think it's and also, you're like that obviously too I think too, it's but. also a, a different age to an era okay so tell us about the songs you played tonight well, I played Polaroids and Postcards, which is actually the name of the current mini album. And the thing is, I released that album in December last year. And because of everything that happened with COVID, I'd had plans to do gigs and launches and all sorts of things, playing the music with a band like I did today. And they all fell through. So it was amazing that I got to do this today actually to get to play the songs and more than just me on keyboard which is the only time that I've ever played those songs before so Polaroids and Postcards is the title track and that like all my songs there's a, usually a bit of a sadness kind of thing in there and this one maybe more than others it's actually about the breakup of a friendship we all write breakup songs but I don't know in my mind I think friends are forever you might not see each other for a while yeah, but yeah. they're still always going to be there it's not like a love affair that tends to burn bright and then maybe it goes badly. Yeah. But in this case, you know, I lost one of my best friends through a certain situation and the song is about that. So It's got great lyrics. Thank you. Yeah. And Rockabilly Blue. Rockabilly Blue is um, probably one of my favourites from the album and it's 
dedicated to um, one of my great friends that I went to uni with in Bathurst. He was a country boy and all, there's a lot of words in that song, um, but they're, most of them are little snippets of memories and things that happened while we were at college. Oh, okay. um, so I bought my first car from him. It was an Alfa Sud, the Alfa Romeo Sud, the little um, Italian sports car. So that's, I talk about punk music in an old Italian car. So I, he taught me how to drive it and, you know, it broke down all the time, but it was beautiful. And he would, another line in the song is, presence in my glove box. The um, doors of the car never locked. And so he would come by my house and stick m mixed CDs that he'd made for me. He introduced me to a lot of music that I probably wouldn't oh, have wow. been exposed to. And he would make mixed CDs and he would just put them in a glove box and not say anything. And then one day I'd, <laughs> so I'd have all these presents in my glove box. Oh, nice. And um, so, yeah, he got a really bad medical diagnosis and it looked like we were going to lose him. So that's when I wrote that song. He's still here. So, oh, <laughs> and he likes the song. I wrote the song and I recorded it and I hadn't said anything to him. And then I thought, I need to send this to him. I don't know how he's going to react. And he loved it. Oh, he's good. been one of my biggest supporters. So that song means a lot to me. Fantastic. And the third one? And the third song um, is Eye to Eye, which is pretty much an out and out love song. It's about standing with someone that you love. You're looking at them eye to eye and there's just nothing to hide. And that's a good thing. Oh, okay. It sounds a little bit sexy. Oh, it's a little bit sexy? It is a little bit sexy. <laughs> have you got to have a little bit of sex in it, don't you? Yeah, yeah no, it's good. So who have you got for your band tonight? Oh, very excited to have a band tonight after playing so many of the songs just by myself, you know, in my little room. So I had Dave Kirby on drums, who's a fabulous guy as well as a great drummer, and I've known him through doing cover bands over the years, but he also plays in the Soul Messengers with Simon... The guitarist Your tonight, who is my husband, mm. who doesn't play on any of my original stuff on my latest couple of albums and EPs, only because we've both been so involved with our own projects and I was going in a more keyboardy direction. But after listening to him play the guitar on these songs tonight, I want him back. And then, of course, I was very lucky to have you come and do backing vocals on one of my songs. And Jo Elms um, sung on a couple of them, and she is a long-term collaborator with me. We do lots of mainly, you know, cover shows and projects together. She's a heavenly singer. And, yes, always a pleasure. Backing vocals for me. I, you know, that kind of my first pick. Yeah, That's what yeah. I want first. Yeah, I want those yeah, voices. I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, you can't beat it. Yeah, and I mean, ideally, I would have a ten piece. One day, I'll be able to afford that. But just having those extra, you know, people with the vibe as well as the sounds tonight was great. Yeah, yeah, no, it sounded, it. It sounded great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming along. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the interviewer has been interviewed, <laughs> I think. <laughs> All the best with everything. And, thank you. Um, hope everyone goes to www.amandaeaston.com yes. and have a look at your marvellous catalogue and have a look at your videos too because they're – and I, I didn't mention your beautiful dress – Look at this. <laughs> it's absolutely stunning. Oh, this is a vintage dress. It's about 1940. And then I got the flowers all sewn on. on. Yeah, see, she's at it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank and, you. And um, all the best with everything in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks.